archive of the photographic evidence that supports uh, each of these notions that, that she is describing. So once again, I encourage you to either the website and or uh, pick up that book uh, to have that record right in your hands. That It means so much when you have that opportunity to peruse it and to, to see those uh, photos for yourself at, at your own pace, in addition to having heard it described on the radio. So Dr. Woods, book, uh, yeah, please, please continue. And, and in the book, uh, the the images and concepts are in the right order with the, you know with words describing everything to the way, all the way through. Where the website, they're just kind of randomly up there. <laughs> it was a, <laughs> it was sort of like a filing cabinet, so it, it's not uh, you know so um, hodgepodge as the uh, website. And in, sure. It, you know, I I point out here's an arrow. Like look here, <laughs> observe. <laughs> sure. Well, you know, Dr. Wood, thus far, we, we've kind of been focused our conversation on uh, why it is that the building did not, in the words of the official report, they use the word collapse, and, and you've described why you don't find that word to be appropriate, that the, the buildings were literally dissolving uh, rather than collapsing. And um, there are also some other anomalies uh, that, that you could probably point to for our listeners that help make that bridge over to the notion of this perhaps being some sort of energy weapon involved. Can you speak to some of those uh, other uh, anomalies that we have the forensic evidence for? Well, the, sure. The, the process of the building coming apart, you see the outer uh, sections of the, the wall. I call them wheat checks. A photographer called it that, and it describes it nicely. They're uh, prefab fabricated sets of three columns wide by three stories tall. And so you see these wheat checks flying out, trailing dust, horrendous amounts of dust, opaque, you know, huge trails of dust. And you watch it coming down towards a particular intersection. And then after the building's finished coming apart, you look and there's just paper and dust in that intersection. You don't see the steel wheat checks there. Ah. Uh-huh. So what was happening, obviously, is the, the steel was turning to dust as it was traveling downward. And it never reached the ground, which makes sense why it didn't make a thud. Dust doesn't make a thud when it hits. Yes. Then yes. after it lands, it, it, uh, there's a picture upwind of the World Trade Center, uh, about you know a block north of Building 1, right soon after uh, the, the building's demise, because you can see the car park starting to uh, put up fumes. And you notice off to the west, clear blue sky, which means the dust settled out of the air. After it came down, it settled out of the air. That had to be coarse dust. And mm. then you start noticing around the firefighter's feet. I call them fuzzballs. I, I came up with terms to represent a phenomenon. If you don't know what it is, don't give it a name of a known phenomenon if you don't know what it is. So it was a placeholder rather than uh, characteristic 57392-A. Sure, sure. It's, and so I call these fuzzballs that round people's feet. It, maybe they kick the dust, but then pretty soon you notice the dust is rising on its own. So what has happened is the dust landed as coarse dust, kept breaking down and became finer and finer until it started rising up, and that is what people were in- inhaling. Ah. It was on the down to the size of DNA, a yeah, hundredth of the size of red blood cells they're inhaling. Interesting. Interesting. Um, not to change the subject, uh, another question that is, it's been on my mind uh, to, to be able to ask you about, uh, there's the, the term rolled up carpets. Uh, could, you, could you speak to that for a moment? Help us understand a little about uh, the ideas there. Okay, these wheat checks, the, the prefabricated sets of three columns wide by three stories tall. If the building is has become weaker because of fire, whatever you want to, reason you want to give, overload, then how is it going to fail? You're going to have buckled beams. They're going to bend over. They're going to bow out and buckle. And they're going to bend around the horizontal axis, like they're bending mm-hmm. over. Okay, yep. But what we find in the debris of, you know, the few wheat checks left, many of them are curled around the vertical axis as though there was a, a twisting around the vertical axis, not bent over, like they're overloaded. The yes. columns are still straight. It's like, so- uh, you know, when you stand on a soda pop can and, and crush it, 
uh, it doesn't curl around the vertical axis. It, it, right. it gets squashed down. Yeah, yeah, uh, which would be with the, with the soda can, it'd be like uh, taking it, holding one hand on the top, one on the bottom, and twisting it. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that, once again, points to the idea that, that the official story, uh, it just doesn't seem to square that it would be intense heat that led to the collapse. Otherwise, we would see that that evidence appear just as you described. It'd be more of a horizontal uh, folding or bending over it. It looked like it wilted. Okay, yeah. You know, the, the, yeah. And as we, I think, all can remember, what was left standing at the end? Straight columns. Hmm. If they had buckled, why would they be straight? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in addition, it, it, it would also seem like what the pictures that we did see at the end, it, it sure seems like there should have been more debris, uh, maybe huge you know, chunks or slabs of con concrete and whatnot, uh, as opposed to what it, we do tend to see in those photos. It, as opposed to powder. Right. Uh, yeah. There's a particular picture that was taken from just across West Street, looking eastward, and if Building 7 uh, well, is still standing so that you know um, that what day it was taken, because Building 7, it, it went away at 5.20 p.m. But So this is before then. But if this picture was taken earlier in the day, you wouldn't be able to see Building 7. You'd have a 110-story building between you and Building 7. Okay, but yes. But here, yep. the rubble is ground level. You see a few outer walls left, and you see an ambulance that had been parked in front of Building 1, Tower 1, and it's still there, but there's no building behind it. Right, right. Where's the debris? It, if, but... if the building collapsed down, why is there nothing left? Exactly, quite right. And, and you know, uh, we're, we're coming up just a couple minutes here until our next break, Dr. Wood, but... Can you uh, continue to tell us about some of these other anomalies that, that stood out to you and that you've had a chance to investigate? Toasted cars. Ah. That's a, a term I coined. They're not burnt. Burnt is a known phenomenon. Toasted meaning they're toast, they're history. Something happened to them, they can't be repaired, they're done. <laughs> they're toast. Okay. And yep. these toasted cars as much as a half a mile away. You know, 1,400 toasted cars, there's enough left of them to count that many cars sure. or vehicles. And they're they're not uniformly toasted. If it was a fire, you know, fire is black, white, shades of gray. You know, you have a really burnt spot and less less burnt spot right at the edge of the fire. What this was is an abrupt edge. It was totally toasted and then pristine condition one nanometer away. Yeah. That, that's I, not I, a natural process. Oh, I think I know the photo that you refer to that you present in the book. It's it's about about halfway along the vehicle. It part of it is just the, the paint is melted and it, it's well toasted, but then the the back part of the vehicle is seems to be intact. Yeah, it looks like it just came off the showroom floor of a new wax job. So I call it the wax spot car because it's got a spot on the other side where it's toasted around it, but it's a circular spot that's not toasted. Interesting. And that uh, that doesn't square also with what we would think of as being damage caused by intense heat or, or fire. Is that fair? Correct. There's this unburned paper around it as well as bushy trees hanging over it, the street. Nothing else on the street gets toasted except the cars. There you have it. Well, Dr. Wood, we need to, do need to take another uh, short break here, folks. Uh, please tune in to these messages from our sponsors. Make sure you support them. Uh, we'll be right back with the National Intel Report here in just a few moments. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to RBN and the National Intel Report. Sitting in for John Statmiller today, I am Antonin Fiore from the Crimson Pill Programs. Folks, uh, we're visiting today with Dr. Judy Wood, who has written the book, Where Did the Towers Go?, uh, asking a number of very, very pertinent questions ab uh, about the, the quote-unquote official uh, story or version of events of that day, uh, and looking at it from, from an evidence-based standpoint, looking at the forensic evidence available and asking these questions. Uh, we'll continue the discussion in just one moment, but I do want to take uh, uh, this opportunity to, to visit with the folks who are out there in the listening audience. Uh, we, we very much appreciate at RBN the support that you have. Since I've come to the network, uh, I've been really very much so impressed by the loyalty of the listening audience and how active and engaged you all are. Uh, the tremendous number of emails that I get that help me in my own continued research, uh, some of the video production that I uh, uh, put forward uh, out on YouTube and, and otherwise, as well as for my future programs. 
But you know, folks, what makes it all possible is not just the support that you give to RBN sponsors, but also the direct uh, contributions that you make directly to the network, uh, in particular with, with the amount of equipment that's necessary. And it also takes some dollars to pay the folks that sit behind the boards and do the work. And we'd like to ask your support. I know John's been mentioning this and some of the hosts here lately, but folks, please, please think, think about this for a moment. Uh, out of all of the mainstream media type access out there, if you've got direct TV or cable, what kind of cost is involved there as opposed to the truth and the quality of the program that, that you get from the many hosts on the network? Myself, I know I've been blown away any number of times. I, I feel like I'm a veteran researcher in pursuit of the truth. And yet I'll turn on John's show one day, or maybe I'm hearing Jeff Bennett or Joey, uh, and I, I'm absolutely blown away by a new topic that they bring to my attention. Uh, I myself have made this kind of uh, support and contribution to the network. I hope you will, too. Uh, you can donate directly through the uh, main website page there. Click on that uh, chip-in link. Or you can call into the network. If, it's, uh, if you'd prefer to visit uh, with someone by phone, you can call in and talk with Sandra or someone else ready to take your call at 800 800- 724-2719. Folks, if it's uh, $20, I'd prefer it's more like $50, or maybe you give us $30 this month and another 30 down the road, 800-724-2719 uh, to help make that, uh, that possible. You can also send a check. The address is listed on the web page. It's 2251 Double Creek Drive, number 302, Round Rock, Texas, 78664. So in either event, we do hope that you'll uh, you'll help support that. I think that uh, most everyone would agree that the quality of information and the and the diversity of the information and truth that's available on RBN is is simply unmatched uh, in in any other outlet. So once again, folks, please do uh, join us in that effort. Now we're coming up close to the top of the hour, and uh, Dr. Wood, what I'd like to do uh, in it, just in this uh, quick piece. We've been talking about some of these anomalies that uh, that caught your eye and caused you to investigate some of these. Maybe you could share with us another one of these elements that uh, led to your research and investigation in this short time we have left before the top of the hour. Weird fires. Weird fires. But it's important to remember, hot things glow, but not everything that glows is hot. Think of a fluorescent light bulb versus an incandescent light bulb. They both glow, one's hot and one's not. So there's different mechanisms that cause things to glow. So don't assume because it's glowing, it's hot. And there are things glowing sitting on pieces of paper that are not burning. So it's glowing for a reason other than because it's hot. And do you, uh, do you have some thoughts along that line? Oh, yeah. There's uh, various weird things like that, that it, like a little uh, bent piece of something it's all bright orange and glowing, sitting on a piece of paper. I mean, this is quite a few pictures like this, and the paper isn't burning. Excellent. Well, well Dr. Wood, I, I'm understanding that we're, we're needing to take the next break, so we'll pause for just a moment. Folks, uh, make sure you join us on the other side of the break to uh, hear our continued thoughts on some of these uh, anomalies. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the National Intel Report here on Republic Broadcasting Network. Our time is 5 o'clock on this 4th. Day of August, Thursday, 2011. Today, our program is, uh, I've affectionately called it Wake the Neighbors Day, where we're trying to talk through bits of evidence, elements of facts that we can use in our conversation with our family, with our friends, with, with perhaps even coworkers, to help spread the message, to help get people awakened, to help get them to think critically about this news and this information that we were being presented, or I think of it as being shoveled to, by the mainstream media, by the uh, official sources. And we're joined today by Dr. Judy Wood, who's written the book, Where Did the Towers Go? Uh, before we continue that discussion, I, I just wanted to take a moment to be able to get some thoughts out here. I know that there are a lot of folks that, that they think that anyone who questions the official version of the events is themselves a, a truther. That's a label that's just seemingly, seemingly automatically and recklessly applied. And all, all too often, unfortunately, they seem to think that people instantly, immediately believe that it's a, an inside job. And that is not the position of Dr. Wood. That's also not my position as well. In fact, uh, the people who were on the 9-11 Commission itself that produced that commission report that is so often referred to, the commission chairman and the commission vice chairman, the chairman being Thomas Keene, former governor of New Jersey, and Lee Hamilton, 
they themselves uh, were involved in uh, in producing a book.